Okay, welcome this morning to session number two, technical session two, introduction to computers. Our objective throughout the course of this particular technical session is gonna be able to describe in a general sense how computers work, uh, including the relationship between hardware, software, and the middle ground firmware. And we're also gonna be talking about some key safety precautions to take and tools you will use to protect yourself and the computer in the event that you need to crack open the case. All right, so DSMs or behavior skills and mindsets we want to keep in mind throughout the course of this particular session is going to be growth mindset. We went over that one in depth yesterday. Uh, we learned our intelligence is not fixed. It changes over time. And like any muscle, if we exercise it, it can get stronger. We have to maintain that when working with computers because it is an ever-changing environment, which directly leads us into adaptability being able to change with the times, with the environment we are in, with the knowledge we have, to be able to learn and grow so we can continually be a valuable member to our team. Because believe it or not, IT is a team sport. Not everyone can know everything on any given team. You're going to have people with different skill sets. Some are going to be better at networking. Some are going to be better at, you know, VoIP or voice over IP. Some are going to be better at security. Now, not only will you lean on these team members for these types of scenarios, but you're also going to be learning from these team members to help improve your skill sets. So as we want to start into this, we're going to start with basic definition of a computer. What exactly is a computer in general? It is an electronic device for storing and processing data. Pretty broad term. Um, some computers you would look at wouldn't necessarily register it as a computer, but that is what it is. Our phones uh, that we carry with us nowadays back in the 90s would have been considered almost a supercomputer with the amount of processing power it has, storage capacity and uh, information access that it can, um, it has, you know, it would be a superpower. There was a funny quote and uh, there was something along the lines is if you could go back a hundred years and tell something to a scholar that would absolutely blow their mind, what would you tell them? You know, well, I have in my pocket a device that allows me access to the summation of human knowledge. And I use it to look up cat videos and make people angry on the internet. So that is, you know, it was a quote I heard, it kind of stuck with me and it was like, yeah, that would kind of make sense. You have an extremely powerful device that you carry with you at all times and we don't even use it near to its potential. So some examples of a computer would be like tablets, smartphones, laptops, desktops, things like that. It can go all the way up to supercomputers, uh, quantum computing, uh, down to smartwatches, things like that. You know, they still operate to store and process data. So four basic types of computers that uh, we need to be aware of in a general sense. First is the supercomputer, which tends to be the fastest, too big for personal use, requires a facility to house it, kind of like it was IBM's Big Blue is one of the more famous ones around now. Uh, mainly used by the scientific community, uh, like geophysicists will use it to create like, you know, global models for climate, stuff like that. Uh, they can do massive computations that we couldn't even imagine um, doing on a regular size computer. Also, they can be used in manufacturing, in the automation of those processes. And then we get down to the next type. We have the mainframes. Yeah, you. 
My bad. <laughs> no, I, I, I did something on my keyboard and I didn't realize that I was on that So my bad. <laughs> no worries. So we have the mainframe, um, which tends to have a ton of storage, uh, lots of input and output devices and can connect across vast distances. And the general example they would use for something like this would be servers like you would use in office buildings and things like that. Um, next, we have the mini computer. Uh, it's a little bit faster than a microcomputer, holds more storage, has access to more input and output devices. Um, example of this would typically be point of sale machines all connecting to a central computer. And then finally, the microcomputer, which is what we are all pretty much familiar with. It's what we use typically in our day to day lives. Um, it is called micro specifically because of the chip, not necessarily the size of the computer itself. And uh, first one was made by IBM. And then for a while there, they called them most computers IBM compatibles, which means they were similar to that. Most of them operated with Microsoft software on them. And uh, they're great for things like, you know, using for productivity, gaming, variety of stuff, surfing the internet, all kinds of fun stuff like that. So the majority of what we'll be doing in this class will be focusing on the microcomputer. All right, very, very basic overview of computer parts. So initially we have hardware, which basically if you can touch it, it is pretty much considered hardware. So it's gonna be like your motherboards, your keyboards, your mouse, CPU, monitors, cameras, RAM modules, you know, if you can touch any of this stuff, it's basically considered hardware. The other side of that corn or coin, corn, ha, coin is software. That's basically the programs we put on them, the applications, you know, Candy Crush, uh, Microsoft Office, Google Sheets, um, Mac OS, Linux, all of that is considered software. The software operates on top of the hardware. It is programming instructions for the hardware on your computer to execute. Then we have what is called firmware. <clears throat> firmware is the middle ground between the two. This is a hardware chip that already has software stored upon it. Basically, it is kind of like basic instructions so that the system can kind of get up and get going. Examples of this would be your ROM storage or read-only memory, which we will get into that, and your BIOS chip, which is your basic input output system chip. When it goes to BIOS, it's basically that tells the computer, where it needs to go to look for everything and how to interact with it. So firmware is your middle ground between hardware and software. Pretty much, Kevin, the most powerful PC you can have is basically the tip of the iceberg. So that we are on the cusp of a major evolution in computers. So we'll see how the next few years play out if they can get that going. All right. Yeah, pretty much. DW. Okay, so hardware, first aspect of it, we're going to you know, dive into this a little bit. You have your components, connectors, slots, ports, and peripherals all in one make up this big hardware network that we're going to be using software to move across and gain functionality out of it because initially when they came out computers really weren't that practical they were more of a hobby 
kind of an interesting thing people did. And it took some amazing leaps in innovation before they became product, uh, practical for the average person. Cost had to come down and met, you know, levels of productivity that it would bring to your daily life needed to be added rather than just a novelty. So firmware, software stored on hardware. Uh, like we're talking about with the BIOS, it is startup instructions for low level hardware. It's typically on a chip that is soldered onto the motherboard, looks something like this. Um, that would be soldered directly onto the motherboard, already has those instructions built upon it, and it does not change readily. It requires some special utility to be able to change it. Um, one of the scariest things you can do as an IT professional with very expensive equipment is something called flashing the BIOS. Because what this is doing is providing an update to your BIOS or UEFI system, which is your startup instructions. And if anything goes wrong during that time, power glitch, anything, you now own a very expensive paperweight. It becomes a brick. So that is one of the you know, more nerve wracking things you'll, you know, you'll have to do as an IT professional. And you'll see some IT professionals go to great lengths to prevent these kind of issues from happening, like making sure you have dual power sources plugged into different breakers, um, you know, with uninterruptible power supplies attached to it. I mean, they, they will go through some pretty, you know, major steps to make sure that nothing goes wrong during that moment because they don't want to break a $50,000 computer or something. Finally, data and instructions are stored on the ROM chips themselves. All right, software. We have two basic groupings under that that we work with. You have your operating systems and your applications and programs. So the operating systems is kind of the overall user interface to control the hardware. Manages most of the communication with the other software items you have on there, your, your applications and your programs. Um, and it controls, for the most part, your inputs and outputs into that system. Examples of that, the big three, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Then finally, you get down to applications and programs. They run on top of operating systems. They, for the most part, perform useful human tasks, uh, run on top of your operating system and are written specifically for those types of operating systems. So like if you have, you know, Microsoft Word on a Windows computer, you can't just take that exact same program and port it over to a Mac OS. It's not gonna work. They're not designed to work on those opposing system, you would actually have to download different software that was able to function, you know, on a Mac. So they do have a version of Microsoft Office for Mac, but it's not interchangeable. You can't just move it over. <clears throat> so examples of this would be Microsoft Office, Apple iWork, specific games, you know, other productivity, things that you can put on there as well. All right, the language of computers, because they don't understand when we type in, you know, open Microsoft Word, you know, they don't, they don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to them. So computers operate off of what is called machine language. And machine language is in binary notation, which means you only have two options. You can either have a zero or a one, which basically means on or off like a light switch that is all it understands so it's a series of ones or zeros almost like morse code going over a line but those ones or zeros get translated into language they can become letters numbers what have you and over time becomes full programs so whenever you type anything into a system this is what it sees and Happy for you, by the end of this course, you'll be able to count to 255 in binary. So how they break these pieces down is a single one or zero is called a bit. So when you hear bit, that is a single decimal 
one or zero. That's it. Then it moves up to a byte, which a byte is a series of eight bits together. There's a smaller notation of it that becomes important when you're dealing with things like hexadecimal, which is called, which you'll also learn about hexadecimal, um, is called a nibble, and that is four bits together. So you have a byte, which is a single, single piece, then you have four together makes a nibble, eight makes a byte. <clears throat> then we really start ramping things up where you get a kilobyte. Notice the uppercase B there. The uppercase B denotes a byte. If that is a lowercase, so if you see a big K and a lower B, that is a kilobit. Big K, big B means kilobyte. And that equals 1,024 bytes. Megabit, megabyte, excuse me, megabyte, big B. That is 1,024 kilobytes. It ramps up in those, in those levels. And then a gigabyte is 1,024 megabytes. To a degree, you've probably heard some of these terms when you're talking about storage on your devices, when you're talking about speeds over the internet, things like that. This is how they denote those quantities. <clears throat> but make sure to pay attention to that last, that B, if it is uppercase or lowercase. So back at this time, um, they actually had a standardized formula that they put together. and basically what combination of bits and bytes equaled what. So they had a universal standard that they all kind of worked off of. And um, ASCII was this. So ASCII basically allowed for you to create up to 128 characters based off of binary code. This was one of the earlier iterations of it and it looks i remember the next tab has something like it so this is what ascii looks like the table lets you know how far up what each is being represented with regards to binary now unfortunately with today's you know characters and stuff that we're using 128 is really not a lot of <laughs> types of characters right so i mean when you consider emojis and all the different symbols we can use that's really not a lot of characters so it quickly became outdated now they're using something that's called utf8 and it has essentially replaced it at this point and it has some amazing like amount that we can use and try to find it real quick. Sorry, bear with me. I'm just trying to find the number for UTF-8. It was, it was quite high. Uh, 1,112,064 characters that you can create with that. So jumping up from 128 from the ASC2 table right here, the total number of characters you could create based off that binary, 128, up to over 1 million from the next iteration of the language. So quite a large jump. You'll see some similar type of jump with regards to IP addresses, being able to you know, give us a unique address to each computer where you have IP version four, um, 
which only allowed for like 4 billion or something like that, which seemed like a lot when they first created it, but we rapidly ran out of that, uh, to, uh, it was like 340 undecillion addresses now with, uh, IP version six, which is quite literally more addresses than there are grains of sand on the earth. So quite a jump. All right, so basic stages and computer process as information is moving through a system. First, you have the data comes in through an input device. That could be a keyboard, it could be a camera, it could be a microphone, what have you. It comes in through this input device and that is sent to the CPU via the memory. The CPU itself processes that data based on the input it has received and the programs that are installed within its memory. And that pushes it on when the CPU is finished processing the data. It is presented through the output device as information, be that your monitor or your speakers or what have you. And then finally, the information can be stored in the computer memory as necessary. So this is just the basic stages of computer processing. A quick little activity for everyone. Give everybody a little privacy. Pause the recording real quick. So yes, yeah, a speaker is an output device. The correlating input for it would be the microphone. Now, if you have a headset with the microphone built on it, that is an input output. It's taking information in from the mic and it's putting information out through your headphones. So what you're wearing now would be an input output. If you just had a, a mic, like what I have here, that is strictly an input device. It doesn't put anything out. And then I have headphones or a speaker, which is where I receive that information out. All right. So I'm sorry, Kelly. Um, you talk about a motherboard. So um, what's that category, um, category the motherboard is going to be? Is it part of the um, hardware or software? It is, it is considered, well, you can touch it. So it's more considered part of the hardware. But there are firmware chips that are soldered onto the motherboard. But the motherboard itself is considered a hardware component. So just that, you know, just think of it mostly in that, in those terms, if I can touch it like a keyboard, that's hardware. I can't touch Microsoft Word and that's software that's running on top of my hardware. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. So these are our processing units. So the CPU, the RAM drives, motherboard, all that fun stuff. And then we have our outputs. So our output devices would be the devices um, that we would receive information back from. That would be our monitor, printer, speakers, the NIC or the network interface card, drives, modem, all that kind of fun stuff are output devices. And again, like we said, some can be both, but we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. So how a computer works, we have our inputs as we were talking about, we had our keyboard, microphone. Uh, what were some other input devices we had? Mouse, there you go. Scanner. Scanner. Modem. Drive. Yeah, modem or Nick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the drives wasn't a input. Well, yeah, drives were input. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Touch screen. screen. And I see. In, yeah, Nick. Oh, touch, screen. Touch, touch screen. Touch screen. Yeah, that would be a good one. Webcam. No, speakers. Is that an input? You talking yeah. about inputs or output? output. I'm talking about inputs. Speakers or output. Input now, input first. Inputs first, that's all I'm talking about is inputs. 
Okay. Who woke? DVD. I saw that. Mouse keyboard. Mouse keyboard. All that kind of fun stuff. Okay. What would be some uh, of our processing units again? CPU. Four big ones. There we got CPU. Motherboard. RAM. Motherboard. Drives. 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 RAM. Drives. Drives. What about Bluetooth? Is Bluetooth input processing or output? What do you think that is? It's input because I have it on my system. So it's an input, but can can you receive information? Can you, is it an output? Yeah, too? you can. So it's both. Yeah. It's both. Yes. Yes. So oh. is, but the Bluetooth both. itself De depends Bluetooth on itself the kind of the Bluetooth technology. you want to use. It is not necessarily input or output. The headphones or whatever you're using, that would be the input output device. Oh. So the Bluetooth itself would be the actual term. Bluetooth would be the connecting program. It's just a medium. Yeah, it's a medium. Mr. Kelly, I'm not talking about the kind of that Bluetooth. Let me show you the one I'm talking about. I have it here on my phone, on my laptop. One second. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about this one. Can you see? Oh, um, so you, you have a Bluetooth adapter. So yes. Yeah. Yes, that would be an input device. Yes. So the adapter could be an input device. All right, outputs. Monitor. Monitor. Speaker. Speaker. Printer. Printer. Scanner. Speakers. Printer. Is scanner an input or output? Input. Oh, I'm input. sorry. Input. Scanner would be an input. The printer Modern. would be the output mechanism of that. Speaker. Speakers. Modern. Nick again. Modem, Modem, Nick. There you go. Printer. So the Modem. all printers can make that kind right. of confusing. Because monitor. The monitor. Yep. So it's like the all-in-one printers can make that kind of confusing because it scans, faxes, and prints. So it becomes an input-output. But if you take each of those components individually, right. you have a fax, which is input-output. You have scanner, which is input. And then you have printer, which is output. What is a NIC? A NIC is a network interface, interface. card. Oh. It is how we communicate with the internet. <clears throat> but we're going to get into that stuff later. We're just kind of, again, just getting introduced to this stuff. All right. Oh, we just did that. So here it is kind of broken down after we went through all that stuff, gives you kind of the, the pieces of it. So you have your keyboard, mouse, microphone, other inputs, your processing, which would be your CPU, your RAM, your drives, uh, motherboard. Then you have your monitor, printer, speakers, and other outputs as well. Oh, another quiz. Pause recording. Mr. Kelly. This meeting is being recorded. All right. So after we got some basic components, just a real general overview of it, we want to get into some of the other stuff that uh, we will be dealing with as a technical, you know, in the IT field. One of the big ones being electricity, fortunately. All computer devices operate off of electricity and we need to be aware of that fact and take the proper precautions so that we can protect not only ourselves but the expensive equipment that we're also working with because either you can get shocked which depending on where you live 110 is unpleasant 220 burns so in the U.S., we tend to operate off of 110. Most other countries operate off of 220 volt uh, for their standard electricity. The other thing is, is you can damage components with extremely low levels of voltage. We need to be careful about that. Things like static electricity can destroy central processing units. It can destroy RAM modules and... You know, we want to make sure we're taking the proper precautions when we're handling any kind of electrical equipment. Certain terms we need to be aware of, a short, which essentially is a sudden increase uh, in the flow that can create 
a sudden increase in temperature. It's where that burning comes in. And uh, then you have a volt, which is your basic unit of measure. That is a unit of electricity measures the actual force of the electricity being pushed through a line. 115 is the common value or 110, like I was just speaking of, and that is typically the unit used here in the US. Uh, Europe, I know, especially operates off of 220, uh, most of Asia, and I think parts of South America as well, if I remember correctly. Um, a watt is the unit of electricity that measures or is used to measure the power consumption of a device itself. Then you have other things called capacitors. They themselves hold electricity. If you look at a motherboard, it looks like something like, like a battery. So it looks, it looks almost like a normal battery, but it's like soldered down onto the motherboard itself. So that is, is called a capacitor and they can store electricity. So even though a device is unplugged, it can still be dangerous because of the electricity stored within the capacitors. So if you see one of these on a board and it is swollen, like it's bulging or it's cracked, that device, the, the board or whatever it is attached to is no good anymore. It needs to be replaced. So that would be a capacitor. Um, we'll get into amps a little bit later. And then you have transformers, which are devices that change the ratio of the voltage to current. Also kind of cool robots that can change into vehicles, but it's another conversation. Um, so just some basic terms to kind of get into as we move in. So. Protecting. Protecting yourself from shocks. shocks. Now, we never ever reach into a computer when it's plugged in. Because electricity cannot be trained. It travels the path of least resistance. And if you create a path, then that's how you end up shocking yourself. I learned that the hard way, Kelly. I am sorry to hear that. I have done that myself. <laughs> it is not fun. At all. <clears throat> Although my brother, out of being out of boredom or whatever, when we were renovating the house, he was wiring um, electrical outlets live because he didn't want to get up and walk to the breaker and turn them off. So he's like, no, nope, I got it. And so it was entertaining for me to watch, but, you know, that's what he wanted to do. I should have videotaped it. Probably would have made a great YouTube video. Um, any case, um, <laughs> you try not to ground yourself. Well, first off, you don't ever reach inside one when it is plugged in. Also remember residual power stored in those fun little capacitors like we talked about, but there's ways to dispel the majority of that charge so that you can make it safe for yourself to work with, you know, work inside the computer. So you don't ground yourself out because once you're grounded, which essentially means you're touching something electronic and you're touching something that allows the electricity to pass through you and then you become the path of least resistance, electricity passes through you to the ground because it can get through you easier than it can through the actual wires it's operating on. Um, other things, power supplies. Unless you are a licensed electrician, do not ever open a power supply. That is something called an FRU or field replaceable unit. Just pull it out. You put a new one in, it's encased in a metal box. Don't open that box. Inside that box, it is just a large cluster of capacitors. It is very dangerous to work on if you don't know what you're doing. So you, there is never an instance where you will open up a power supply. CRT monitors, same thing. Those are those big, heavy tube uh, monitors, like old school, like you'd see you know, like your, your parents' or grandparents' house. You don't see them much anymore, but 
there are some still out there. We don't try to repair these. We send them off for recycling uh, because they have a ton of capacitors as well as some hazardous materials inside of them. They are particularly dangerous to work on, not worth it. So we don't attempt to repair these. Printers, some printers, especially considered laser printers, they have what are called high voltage power supplies in them, which make them even more dangerous than a regular one. Leave them be. <laughs> Call in a, a professional or send it off to be repaired by somebody else. You know, power supplies aren't that expensive. It is not worth the potential cost. But don't worry, we will reiterate that point many times throughout this course. All right, fire extinguishers. There's the three main classes we need to be aware of. You have, and you're sitting there going, do I really need to know this? Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> Questions on this have come up on 1001. I had a question on this on my 1001. <laughs> and it's a gimme if you, if you uh, know it. Just remember, class A, that's basically water in a pump bucket. So it just sprays water. It's mostly for wood and paper and stuff like that. Class B, that puts out fires caused by liquids, kerosene, gas, oil, things like that. It's kind of like a foam. Class C is a non-conductive chemical used to put out electrical fires. So which one do you think we're going to be using the most if we have to use one? C. C. There we go. So... C is the one that we're going to be gravitating towards in our field, but you need to be aware of the other two and what the classifications mean. There also happen to be uh, ones that you may see mentioned. I believe it's argon um, extinguishers. They were used in server farms for quite some time, except unfortunately what argon does is it displaces all the oxygen in the room um, so that that uh, quells the fire, puts it out pretty quickly. Problem being, if there are humans in the room, it's not good when you displace all the oxygen. Uh, so they're working to replace those with something else. But there still are some older server rooms that may have those and they actually have respiratory devices around the room in case there's a human in there that you can grab one of those, put it on and still be okay. Yeah, there's an argon um, fire extinguisher in, in my, my server room. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they have a respirator in there and say, so if, if there's a fire. But no, they don't. Oh, well, that's exciting. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's how they use in some of the older server rooms. I think they are working to replace these. But as you can, as you've just heard from Greg, they are still to a degree in use. Um, let's see here. That's it for uh, fire extinguishers. On to electrostatic discharge. This is something not many of us think of very often. I'm sure at some point when you were a kid, especially if you had siblings, you'd run around the house in wintertime with socks on and then run over and zap your sibling, you know, or your parent or what have you. You know, it's usually like the, you know, the week after a kid first discovers they can do that. It's just nonstop. <clears throat> well, to computers, you can destroy a computer with that. So you can destroy a computer component with as little as 100 volts. That's it, 100 volts, and that can destroy a chip. It can over overload it and fry it. We can't even feel it until it's about two to 3,000 volts. So you can't even feel a zap from a, like, you know, you touch a doorknob or something like that when you feel a little shock. That's over 2,000 volts when you feel it, that little snap. Well, you can't even see it, I think, until 10,000 volts. So when you see it, that little spark, that's about 10,000 volts. And again, and pair that down, chip can be damaged with as little as 100. And... You get two types of failure. You have catastrophic failure, which means it's pretty much done. 
And then you have upset failure where it damages the component so it does not work well. Hopefully, if any kind of damage is done, at least it's catastrophic so you know what it is and you can replace it right away. Upset failure can be annoying to try to diagnose because it may be intermittent. So it may not do it all the time. You ever had that problem with your car where it's making a funny noise or it's acting weird. You take it to the mechanic and the mechanic drives around the block. Yeah, everything works fine. That's the intermittent problems. You know, we have that in IT too. It, it happens, you know, like, so like it's kind of there, but it only happens at certain times. So how do we contain this kind of stuff so, so that we, we don't damage components and you know we make sure we're safe. We're not getting shocked. We're not shocking the computer. You know, at the end of the repair, both the computer's happy and we're happy. We always got to make sure we ground ourselves effectively, effectively to the equipment. And there are a couple ways we can do this. One of which is the ESD bracelet. It looks like this right here. It's a little little bracelet. Straps around your wrist. Got a little metal tab on it that attaches to your skin. Make sure it's snugly attached, has this fun little wire that loves to get in the way with an alligator clip on the end of it. And you clip that wire to a bare metal piece on the inside of the case, not the board attached to the case itself. And that neutralizes the charge between you and the computer itself so that you can safely work on it without you know, destroying it. They also make ESD mats that either you can stand on or you can put your equipment on. And then when you're transporting components from one point to another, you don't wanna just willy nilly throw it in your bag or just kind of carry it around, stuff like that. No, they have these little bags, anti-static bags that can shield the components that you can store them in and transport them safely. I don't know if, if any of you have ever you know, ordered computer components online or built your own stuff. They come in these funny grayish purplish bags. Um, those are great for storing and transporting stuff. Even after you've installed the components, if you're a computer tech, it's always good to hang on to a few of those just in case you get a component that you're pulling out of a computer that's still good. You can store it in those bags and prob probably reuse it later. And finally, we have ESD gloves. Um, if you're doing a lot of work on computers, uh, these are nice to have because you don't have to keep unhooking and rehooking. You just work with the gloves and you're pretty well good to go. Um, also, uh, like we had a young lady in our cohort who uh, she refused no matter what to take off her wedding ring. I respect that. However, you know, coming from a mechanical background at some point, you kind of know, you know, certain incidents tell you like you always take off your wedding ring anytime you're doing any mechanical repairs especially if you're working with high voltage or any of that stuff. But she didn't want to take it off. That was her thing. I refused to take off her wedding ring. Respect that. So she chose to go the ESD glove route because that protected the jewelry and herself from, you know, getting shocked. So the jewelry wouldn't snag on anything. And it also didn't touch things and ground it out. So wrist strap is the most common. It's this one right here. Um, most kits you, you buy will have one of those in it. And thankfully, they are relatively inexpensive. All right, protection rules. When you're working with someone else and you need to pass a component from you to that person, as you're holding that component, reach out and touch that person on the arm before you hand the component to them, because that way you will neutralize the charge between the two of you there's no chance of a shock. If the shock happens, it's happening between the hand that is not holding the component. And then you would reach over and hand over the component. Other thing is, like we talked about in the previous slide, you always want to store components in anti-static bags until the moment you are ready to install them. You don't stack components. You don't lean them up against each other. All that kind of stuff can damage components. You do not want to do that. You need to have a good open space to work on. Preferably keep stuff in the, in the bags that they come in until the very last minute. When you're working on computers, be sure to check the humidity. Make sure it is not too dry. Also, you wanna make sure it is not too humid. Computers like it around 50%. Humidity gets too high, bad things can happen. Humidity gets too low, bad things can happen. Too low, you get 
higher chances of static electricity, <clears throat> which those of you who live up north in the wintertime and run heaters know what I'm talking about. And then um, <clears throat> things like packing peanuts, packing tape, all that kind of stuff. Make sure all that stuff is removed and placed away from your area because they attract static electricity. If you've ever opened up anything with packing peanuts, what does it do? Like the peanuts seem to stick to everything. You know, as you're moving around, that's static electricity that's keeping everything attached. So packing peanuts is probably one of the most dangerous things for components just because they are able to um, attract that charge pretty easily. Not a problem for myself, but tying back loose hair, make sure it's out of the way because you don't want it falling in and snagging on things. <clears throat> also removing any loose jewelry, dangly earrings, bangles, bracelets, things of that nature. Make sure that's removed because they can brush up against components and create a connection between two causing a short. So wanna make sure we do that as well. All right, any questions so far? We're all good to reach inside a computer now. All right. I feel confident. That's good. I like that. All right, tools, necessary equipment, pretty basic list. You can pick up like nice little fun toolkits relatively inexpensive online if you so choose. Oft times your employers, if you're gonna be working on hardware and software will provide kits for you. Although if you're doing a lot of work on computers, many technicians will kind of invest in their own equipment just because it's, you know, it can be more comfortable, better quality, things like that. You see that in mechanic shops for cars as well. You know, you know, mechanics will have their own toolboxes. They'll lock that sucker up at night when they leave and they don't want anybody touching their tools. Same thing can happen in computer techs. You know, if they're doing it a lot, they have brands that they like, tools that they like to use, certain quality level, and they want to make sure they invest in that and they'll be quite protective of it. So we're going to get over, go over just a few of the basic tools here. First would be that grounding bracelet, grounding mat and grounding gloves. We did see that bracelet in the previous slide. It's that little strap that goes around with a little coiled wire that hooks up. Um, in here, you'll see there is a set of screwdrivers, the most common being a Phillips. So this would be your screwdriver in here. It comes with a variety of bits that you can use. And this is for more for desktop computers, this type of kit. Laptops and mobile devices um, has a different type of kit, much smaller screwdrivers and tools and stuff. You'll use pry bars, stuff like that. This is a basic kit for a desktop. Um, you have this little hook thing right here. And um, let me draw it out here because yeah, I, you know, I got to work on my horrible drawing skills here. Let me get a... So chip extractor is kind of like a U-shaped thing like this. And then it has these little prongs that come in like this. And they go around a CPU chip and you, you crimp it or grab it like a pair of pliers. You can pick it up safely, move it to where it needs to go and set it in. You may, may be tempted to just go, you know what, I just grabbed that with my fingers. It's so much easier. But I have a cautionary tale for all of you. In my cohort, we were building a gaming computer and we got down to where it was time to install the CPU. And our TA was the one leading the, uh, the build and was going to install the brand new CPU. And it was an AMD processor, which is called, a, which is technically considered a PGA or pin grid array. It has like hundreds of little tiny pins on the bottom of it. They're about the thickness of a human hair on the bottom of this microchip. And he just grabbed it out with his fingers. And as he was going to put it in, because he was a little nervous talking in front of so many people, he drops the chip and it bangs right off the side of the computer, bending about 40 of those, 20 to 40 of those little pins. <clears throat> so obviously you can't just pick it up and set it in and just hope for the best. 
Um, luckily, I had a precision kit in my car, which had a magnifying glass and all that fun stuff. Went and got it. And then myself and the professor spent over an hour gently trying to straighten out these tiny little pins, hoping to goodness one of them didn't break to get it installed. So trust me when I say you don't want to go through that stress. It takes you a couple seconds more. Just use the chip extractor. That's all I'm saying. Because CPUs are cheap. <laughs> They're less expensive than, say, a graphics you know, card. But they're still not cheap. So that's your little your, your chip extractor. That's my cautionary tale for all of you. <clears throat> and then they come with these. Also, this kit comes with these little containers here where you can put the screws in. Um, so you can organize your work as you go. This right here on the end is the chip extractor. It looks like a little horseshoe. And it has these little hooks on either side of it like that. So yeah, this is a very, very basic kit. Some are, some can be a lot more elaborate. So, you know, but this is about as basic as you can get. You can get, you know, about most of the things you want to done on a desktop with this, this kit. This is what we had to work with. So, all right. Next, this is a post-diagnostic card. Occasionally you'll see these, but it's actually relatively uncommon. And what post is, is power on self-test. When you first turn your computer on, it runs through a series of checks to make sure everything is working okay, everything's connected properly, we're all good to go, and then it moves forward to, okay, where's the operating system, and then I'll boot up. I don't know if any of you have ever turned on your computer and you got a series of like beep, 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 and then it didn't turn on. Gave you like a couple of short beeps or something like that, and then didn't go any further. That's what's called a post error. I mean, something internally on the computer is not working properly. And the types of beeps you get will tell you what's wrong, what kind of error you have. With us, as we are, you know, taking things apart and putting things back together, <clears throat> if we get a post error, it's probably what we just touched. If we were installing RAM and then we turn the computer back on and we get a post error, it's likely we didn't seat the RAM properly. We need to go back, reseat the RAM, and that'll fix the post error. But this is what's called a post diagnostic card. And you would plug it in. And as you turn it on, it would give you a readout as to the error you're receiving. But again, this is an uncommon device you will see. Uh, some places have them, but for the most part, they don't. You could sit there and just Google the uh, motherboard and say, I had three short beeps and a long beep on a, you know, Intel motherboard. I mean, whatever model it is. And they'll say, okay, well, that's this error. So they'll give it to you. But just so you're aware, if you see one of these, that is what it is. Hey, Kelly. Yes. Yeah, just to clarify for them. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, the card that you have on the screen is what they're, they're unlike, unlikely to see. but motherboards all have their own post card embedded in them, right? Well, they can give you a post error, but they won't have necessarily a card like this that would give you a digital readout. Right, but then, uh, sorry, what I meant to say is um, that process with the error code, with the beeps, is the post process. Yes, in, that that's in, every motherboard. Yeah, yeah, That's the warning system to tell you something is wrong. But what this is, is this is just a diagnostic tool that you can plug in and it will tell you what those errors are. Right, and then those beeps that you get are specific to the type of error that you that that, that <clears throat> the system is experiencing. Yes. So the beeps, like you might get two short beeps and a long beep, and it tells you your RAM module is bad. It could be three long beeps and tell you, you know, <laughs> that your NIC card is damaged or something like that. So the beeps tell you exactly what the error is, and it's the types of beeps and the motherboard you have tell you what the error is. 
Yeah, they're just letting you guys know when we get test out, there's at least like four labs that deal with this when you having to figure out the errors with post. Yeah. Would, would, it, would, would the labs also go over the, the lights? Because they are, um, Dell since I think 2002 um, started including um, the four lights, a uh, combination of the lights tell you what's, what, what you did wrong or what's wrong with the machine. So at, at the post, you would have, you know, light number one come on and it goes through fine. But if light mm -hmm. two, three, four, or a combination of those come on, it's telling you something else is wrong. Well, that would be like a way to replace the beeps. Yes. But exactly. that would be specific to Dell. Yes. So that would be one of those things where like, you're like, okay, lights two and four are on. What does that mean? And you could just, you know, look it up in their manufacturer. So, you know, but that would be just one of those things where, you know, maybe they were making it so that people who are, you know, have hearing issues would still be able to work on the system without problem. Mm, okay. That makes sense. So it's, it's more like, that was more like an accommodation um, addition rather than, you know, changing up everything entirely. So. All right. That's our post. Diagnostics card. We're just going to finish up real quick and then we're going to take our break and then we'll come back. So we only got like two or three slides left. All right. Other tools. These are our networking tools. You will see these again um, up here, right here. Looks like a pair of pliers, kind of a funky pair of pliers. That is a cable crimper. And what this does is it allows you to put the caps on the ends of like Ethernet cables or phone cables or, you know, RJ45 and RJ11s. Um, you would put them in here once the wires were in and then it crimps them down on the end of the cable so that they're firmly on there. That's basically what this tool is. Um, some of you may be familiar with this one, the multimeter. It allows you to test specific wires to see if you have continuity or if you have voltage coming through. And if you do have voltage coming through, is it the proper voltage or are you getting a dec decrease in voltage? So that would be a multimeter. Uh, cable stripper, they do have individual cable strippers, but there actually is one here on this crimper as well. It's just like a little blade with a loop and it allows you to strip off the casing from a cable uh, so that you can expose either the smaller cables within it or the copper wires underneath. <clears throat> uh, one that they do not have on here, but I will show later is called a tone generator and a probe. And what that does is you essentially, you hook up something to a copper line. They do have the same thing for fiber optics, but you hook up a, uh, something to a copper line, either through an alligator clip or through an internet, ethernet cable. And it sends a musical tone over that copper wire. So like if you're trying to figure out which port on your um, punch down block is correlating with the outlet next to a desk, you could plug in the tone generator in one, you take the probe into the, the cabinet where the server is, and you can sit there and touch each individual wires. And then when you hear that tone, that lets you know that's the wire you're looking for. So it makes it easy to find wires so you don't have to trace them physically through the walls. So that is a tone generator or probe. It can also be called a fox and hound. So that is another name they will use for a tone generator and probe. I have one in my toolbox, but just, I don't have that with me right now. Then up here, this little device, you have this little small piece that can disconnect from this larger piece. And this is a cable tester. What it does is you plug in one end of the cable in one, one of those devices, and then the other device that's disconnected, you plug it in on that one and it runs a tone down each one of those wires and make sure that they are properly connected in the right order. So you know if the cables were made correctly or if there was a break in the cable or a short in the cable or what have you, this cable tester will let you know if the cable is, there's something wrong with the cable. This is a very, very basic form of them. One of them, they do have very sophisticated ones that can give you a lot more information, but they can range in a couple thousand dollars. You don't necessarily need something like that. You can pick up something like this for maybe 10 bucks. Yes. 
Thank you, Vaughn. All right. Um, the other is final tool down here, right here, is called the punch down tool. Um, that is essentially, it has, let me draw it off here real quick. So you have the tool, comes down like this. A wonderful drawing skills and it has a flat edge on one side. There's a loop. Then it has a knife edge on the other. So what it does is it pushes this side of the cable or the punch down tool pushes the wire down in. The other side of it here cuts the wire off. So when you're creating, when you're pushing wires down into a punch down block, which we'll show you that when we get into cables and connectors, um, this tool is used to do that and it cuts off the ends of those wires to make it look nice and clean. So you don't have a bunch of little straggly pieces of the wires hanging off the ends once you've made your connection. So, you know, it pushes everything in so the connections are made seamlessly and cuts everything off at the end. Other thing would be a loop back plug, which I will show you one of those here. Let me grab my toolbox real quick and pause the recording. Take two seconds.